up with about 84 different answers because God has touched all of our lives in really significant ways. You know, and as I thought of, of, of what we were going to share, especially at this site, Sean and I had the opportunity to come down here on our free day and, and hang out here and, and spend a little time praying. And the thing the Lord really laid on my heart, believe it or not, was Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. I think if there's one thing that we can take away from all of this, it's what Jesus told the disciples immediately before he left. He said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in all Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Well, we all have an opportunity to be witnesses now because we've witnessed something. We've had the unique opportunity not just to hear about Bible things and Bible places and Bible events. We've seen it. We've had the opportunity. Doesn't it blow your mind to think that when we were standing, for instance, on the south steps of the temple, we were standing in the same place where Jesus himself stood and, and spoke and taught during those times, those, those mikvahs that were just down from those south steps were the very same places that the 3,000 men who gave their lives to Christ at Pentecost got baptized on that day. That absolutely blows my mind, but, but there's no more mind-blowing witness that we have than, than what this place, the garden tomb, represents. Is this the place where Jesus rose? It was at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. We may not know this side of heaven. But what this represents is something incredibly important. We are witnesses, Jesus said. That is, in a sense, our job description. It's who we are. So how do we take this amazing blessing that we've received, this opportunity to get face to face with the Holy Land, and take it with us and use it not just to bless us, not just to warm the cockles of our spiritual hearts, but to be a blessing to other people. Well, here in this setting, here at, at, at the Garden Tomb, uh, it's such a wonderful place to be able to share a, a message about what the first witnesses were really all about. Uh, if you've got a Bible handy, uh, turn with me to the book of John, chapter 20. And I just want to share real quickly three insights into being a witness that I think you can take with you from this trip and uh, use them to make you usable to be able to rock your world just like the first disciples were used to rock their world back then. Uh, you know, right off the bat in John chapter 20 and verse 1, it says, Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been rolled away from the tomb. Well, just try to imagine what that was like for Mary Magdalene. I mean, we could go on about the stone being rolled away from the tomb. In fact, the, the original language carries the idea that the stone wasn't just rolled away, like, like just, you know, very neatly uh, rolled away in its group. Uh, the word there in Greek is iro. It, it carries the idea of tossing something aside almost trivially. In, in other words, the, the stone that was in front of that tomb was probably, you know, feet if not yards away from the site. But the thing I call to your attention probably most practically is who is the first person to come to grips with arguably the most significant event in the history of the universe? It's Mary Magdalene. Now, as a result of this trip, you and I have uh, kind of the catbird seat, if you will, uh, front row center seats in terms of understanding a little bit more about Mary Magdalene than maybe we did before. You remember the synagogue at Magdala? I mean, that was a mind blower to me, to walk into that place and to see that portico with a little bench is still uh, in place there, and it's to think that Jesus sat there and he ministered there. Well, Mary Magdalene literally means Mary from Magdala. Boy, it harkens back to the first part of this trip, and boy, I just love Galilee. Oh, yeah. Didn't you love Galilee? It's just such a beautiful and tranquil place. But Mary Magdalene was anything but a beautiful and a tranquil person before Jesus got a hold of her. As a matter of fact, in the, in the book of Mark chapter 16, we are told that Mary Magdalene was a woman from whom Jesus cast out seven demons. Now, you know, whether there were only seven or whether seven is the number of completion, uh, Mary was as demon-possessed as you could have possibly been 
when Jesus got a hold of her. How did she get into that state? Well, uh, again, we went to, up to Caesarea Philippi. Maybe she was flirting around uh, with the Temple of Pan. Uh, I, I guess Mary Magdalene would be uh, the first person we find in Scripture at a panic attack, you know. <laughs> but suffice it to say, when you talk about a person that, that God from before the foundation of the world would choose to be a witness of the resurrection, the first person to come to grips with the fact that Jesus had risen from the dead, Mary Magdalene, you know, I'm sorry, I, I'm so glad that God doesn't consult with me on his plans. <laughs> because I would say, God, you got this one all wrong. I, I mean, you want to talk about three strikes you're out. A, Mary Magdalene was a woman. A, a woman's testimony was not allowed in a Jewish court. They were considered absolutely unreliable, couldn't share in a Jewish court. Their testimony was invalid. Secondly, not just, just socially, but, uh, but uh, again, sexually. Uh, a pious Jew of Jesus' time would begin their morning prayers by saying, I thank thee, Lord God, King of the universe, that I was not born a slave, a Gentile, or a woman. <laughs> and yet here we see this woman, this, this, this individual that, whose testimony would not be valid in court, being selected for this incredible honor. How about spiritually? You know, if anybody had caught Mary Magdalene's act back in Magdala, uh, yeah, you know, I remember you, the pea soup and the head rotating around. I remember what you used to be like. I'm not sure I'm going to take spiritual pointers from someone like you. And yet, who does God select to be a witness for him? Boy, that encourages me, right? Because there's some times where we look at our lives and we say to ourselves, oh, you know, I just don't know all the answers. I've never been to seminary, you know. I've got so many problems in my life right now. How in the world could I possibly be a witness? Well, take a word of encouragement. God loves to use the Mary Magdalene's of this world to blow the minds of people who are supremely, maybe overqualified to be witnesses for God's glory. You've got a story to tell. Not just because you've been to the Holy Land and have seen these things with your own eyes, but prayerfully, you've got a story to tell because Jesus has changed your life. Boy, don't undersell that for a minute. You know, sometimes we hang out with Christians and, and you know, we kind of get involved with the Holy Huddle and we forget what it was like to be on the outside looking in at the love of God. Do you know sometimes the most simple truths that you can share with people are the most astounding? Uh, you know, I was ch I was going to through the checkout line at Costco after uh, church on Sunday. Kind of our routine. We get done with church. You know, we're heading back home, and we go by Costco and load up for the week. And we had a wonderful time at church, you know. And I just kind of smile on my face, and the checkout lady at Costco says, "What, what are you so happy about?" And I just even think twice about it. I said, "Well, I'm going to heaven." <laughs> and she said, "Really?" <laughs> and I said, "Yeah." <laughs> Now that sounds like a simple truth, but that lady had never heard anybody say that, at least in the line at Costco that day. <laughs> Stop and think how revolutionary the idea is that God loves you. That Just sharing that with somebody that doesn't go to church and, and to be able to say God not only loves you, but he proved it by becoming a man and walking among us and rising from the dead in a moment of history. Boy, that's the second thing we run into here in Acts chapter 20. Here we see this unlikely witness, and notice what she does after she has this mind-blowing discovery. Verse 2 says, Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've laid him. Well, Mary Magdalene is completely confused at this time. You know, and, and I love this because, you know, it just so removes all of this from the stained glass images of, you know, the early Christians standing around going, yes, we always anticipated that this glorious thing would happen. No, no, she's freaking out. But bless her pointy little head, instead of letting fear drive her away into isolation, she sought out the disciples. And boy, you know, we as human beings, I think it was Chuck Swindoller once said, we're the only species who tends to uh, pick up speed the more lost we get. <laughs> and maybe that's been true in your life. But notice what she does. She does the right thing. She goes to Peter and to John, and she just basically says to them what she knew. She didn't know exactly why that tomb was empty at this point. All she knew was that it was empty. Now notice it says, Peter therefore went out 
and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. Now, now I, I have just a little bit of an aside, but I just love this about the Apostle John. Uh, you know, he's kind of the humble guy, right? You know, the guy won't use his own name, you know, in his gospel, but he refers to himself as, you know, <clears throat> I'm the disciple whom Jesus loved. You know, and, and it seems like John and Peter kind of had a little bit of a rivalry going on because, uh, you know, in the, 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 uh, the situation in the garden, uh, you know, where the high priest's uh, servant's ear gets slashed off, none of the other gospel writers really mention the disciple, but John's like, it, it was Peter. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then we see the crowning, uh, uh, the, 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 the crowning achievement here. You know, we both ran to the tomb, but, but you know, the, disi the other disciple, I, I outran him. I won the race, you know, I'm the first one here. I, I just love that. But notice it says, and he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloth lying there, yet he didn't go in. Now here the language is really interesting. Uh, the word that is used uh, uh, that describes John looking in is a word in Greek that carries the idea of glancing at something, just taking a look at something superficially, seeing the outside of something. Now notice, John looks in, and as you walked around that entryway, you can probably imagine him looking around that corner inside, scoping out what was going on, but, but not going in. He's like a little freaked out, maybe a lot freaked out about what's going on here. And, and, and notice he gets deeper. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head not lying with the linen cloths but folded together in a place by himself, by itself. Now, now here we see Peter, and you know, let's face it, Peter's courage had collapsed uh, during the arrest and betrayal of Jesus, but it seems like he's kind of getting his feet back from underneath him. You know, John is just like, whoa, Twilight Zone, I'm not going in there, this is freaky. <laughs> Peter boldly goes in and he takes a look around. And, and what is described there is really interesting. It talks about the grave clothes lying in state. In, you know, in, in other words, it looked as if the body had evaporated out of these grave clothes. In fact, the word to look, you know, when Peter saw here is a really interesting word in Greek. It's a Greek word, theoreo. We get our term theorize from that. It carries the idea of not just looking at something, but checking something out and almost, you know, scrutinizing it, trying to, to make sense of it, trying to put two and two together. I mean, the wheels are turning in Peter's head. But he's still not sure exactly what's going on here. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first, you know, John, I, I won the race, you know, again, mm -hmm. uh, went in also and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. Now, now interesting, John says that he saw and believed. Well, believe what? Well, not that Jesus had risen from the dead. They hadn't put two and two together yet. All they believed was that Mary Magdalene's story was true, that something really freaky had gone down at this tomb. I mean, they were just going on what they saw, and, 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 and it was going to take a personal appearance by Jesus to put all of this together. But here I think we see another important point about being a witness. A witness is not just a person that, say, has a changed life to be able to share with other people. But a witness also understands why they believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead in a moment of history. Boy, you know, I, I, I realize that we pastoral types love our Bible studies and we love, you know, putting all these different things together. And, you know, like Robert said on a number of occasions, I love teaching here and I'm gonna teach here. Teach here. You know, it's, it's just a wonderful thing to be able to share. But I, I realize that, that if you're, you say, not particularly gifted as a pastor, you might find yourself saying, ah, I'm going to leave this to the professionals. You know, yeah, well, you know, uh, I, I guess I believe because I believe. You know, I, I believe because I go to church and I feel good. I, I believe because that guy behind the pulpit seems real, real convinced that these things are true. Hey, gang, take the time to investigate what you believe and why you believe it about your own faith. Why you believe that that tomb was empty on the first day. And it's such an important thing to have under your belt, not just that you can share with other people, but sooner or later life is going to come at you hard and heavy. 
I, I mean, sooner or later, let's face it, the greatest trial is going to come knocking on our door. Uh, you know, the statistics on death are most impressive. One out of one people die. <laughs> and, and sooner or later, you and I are going to be in that place. When that death due lies cold on your brow, I guarantee you the, the reality that Jesus rose from the dead isn't just going to be theoretical to you. It's going to matter more than anything else. And you're really going to want to do your homework there. Because in John 14 and verse 19, Jesus said, because I live, you will live also. Boy, don't put your hope of everlasting life on someone's story about seeing a light at the end of the tunnel or, you know, I, I saw a, uh, a, a deal on one of the tabloids in the, the checkout line, reincarnation proven, baby born with pirate's peg leg, you know, these sort of things. Don't, don't put your faith in something that flips. I mean, find out why you really believe that Jesus rose from the dead because it's not only going to bless you, but it's also going to give you confidence in being able to tell people about the reality of Jesus Christ. That's the second part of being a witness. And, and just real quickly, the third part here is so powerful. Verse 11 says, But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb and saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Now, now notice there were two angels and Mary there. I guess that would that would uh, fit the uh, six people only in, in the tomb uh, limitation that we have. <laughs> But notice it says, Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've laid him. Now, when she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned around and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I'm ascending to my father and to your father, to your God and to my God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Now, another gospel tells us that the disciples didn't buy it, by the way. You know, they thought, uh, in the other gospel account, it says that she is speaking idle tales. You know, like, you've lost your mind, Mary. You know, you, you've kind of gone back to where you were at Magdala or something like that. But Mary shared from her own personal testimony, catch this, not for results, but because she wanted to be faithful, because God had touched her, you see. Boy, one of the most beautiful, beautiful things here is the moment of recognition. The moment that Mary put two and two together that Jesus had really risen from the dead was when? When Jesus called her by name. <laughs> now, I, I don't know the, the inflection in that voice that, that, that Jesus used, but have you ever noticed that someone who really loves you has a very special way of saying your name? Unlike any other, I remember when I was a little kid, if, if I heard uh, my parents use my first, middle, and last name, yeah. I knew I was in big trouble. There was a little inflection involved with all of that. But, but especially people that you know and that you love, that you have that relationship, they say your name like nobody else ever can. And I think that was that moment of recognition. Mary had heard Jesus say her name in so many occasions. Mary had heard Jesus say, you know, Mary, I love you, or Mary, your sins are forgiven. Mary, you can have a brand new life. And so when Jesus said that, <laughs> man, instant recognition. By the way, did you know that Jesus knows you by name? That he called you by name to be a part of his forever family? As a matter of fact, in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, we are told one of the rewards for the faithful, the overcomers in the church, is that Jesus is going to give you a new name that only you and he know. That's the kind of intimacy that lies ahead of us as believers in Christ. So, you know, again, some people will say, well, you know, Scott, I'd love to be a witness, but I just don't think that God can possibly use me. Well, God delights in using people that have exactly that kind of expectation. And in fact, the more unusable you think you are, the more usable you are in God because he delights in confounding the strong with the weak. Mm -hmm. Secondly, do you have something to share in terms of knowing what you believe and why you believe it? That's why we do Bible study, gang. That's why you do trips to the Holy Land. 
so you can have that foundation for faith that won't fail you and will also give you confidence in reaching out to others with the love of Jesus Christ. But most importantly, people don't want to hear about religion. I don't know about you, no, no critique uh, of other people and their things and all that, but I was so grieved walking through that Church of the Holy Sepulchre because it was like religion on parade. I mean, it just seemed so empty to me and so sad and so heavy and, and, and so distant and removed from a personal relationship with God. I guess that's why I love this place, because it's so simple. You know, it, it, it's just so Jesus-like. G.K. Chesterton once said, I can more easily see Jesus sweeping the streets of London than issuing edicts from its cathedrals. That's the kind of relationship that God calls us into in Jesus. And if you've got that relationship, I guarantee you, you've got something to share with a world in desperate need of the love of Jesus Christ. Well, you know, as a pastor, and, and I know Robert will bear witness to me, I'm sure Troy will as well, and, and Johnny as well, we get people who come to us with horrific problems. Just, just stuff that you would never even dream that people could go through. You know, you know they're, they're pouring out their hearts. And sometimes people will ask us, and I know these guys will bear witness to me on that, how do you handle that? I mean, how do you handle it when people come to you and it's just their whole lives are falling apart and they're looking to you for some kind of, kind of uh, direction or guidance? Well, I've got a very simple answer to that. I just smile and I tell people, that's why I'm glad I'm not their answer. But I know who is. And that's Jesus. Jesus is the one who puts people's lives together. Jesus is the one who gives us hope. Jesus is the one who can transform us. And, and Jesus is the whole reason we took this trip. So we've come to the end of the trip. We're going to be sharing communion. Now, what a beautiful place to share communion. We get to have communion in the Holy Land. What an exciting thing. And hopefully as we take communion, what we're going to remember from all of this is the reality of what God has done in our lives, that God has changed our lives, that he has given us something to share, more than just places and a, and a nice trip that we went on, but a true encounter with a living God. So I'm going to turn things over to Robert now. Robert's going to lead us in communion. But as Robert, as you come up, let's just, let's just pray and thank the Lord right now. Father, what a blessing that we could be here today. What an amazing thing that, that we are here in, in the very city that you're coming back to when you return, Jesus. And, and, and standing here at this site with this, this empty tomb behind us, Lord, we want to always remember that. We want to remember that you suffered and died on the cross at Calvary, the place of the skull, but that the story didn't end there that you rose from the dead, and that you gave incontrovertible evidence to that effect so that we could share boldly in this world and be witnesses. Oh, give us the power now to be witnesses. And now as we take communion, let us bear witness to the fact that our whole relationship with you is not based on anything we do for you, but what you've done for us. We rejoice in that truth in Jesus' name, amen. amen.